Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Whalen, Associate Vice President for Curriculum at Hillsdale College. We're sitting here with Dr. Larry Arn, President of Hillsdale College. We've had so many requests for an update about the college and also about Dr. Arn's thoughts regarding the rather unusual circumstances we find ourselves in. We thought we might uh, take the time to sit down and have a live stream conversation and answer some questions, some of which were sent to us uh, before this event and some which will be sent to us uh, during the course of this conversation. So with that, uh, let's turn it over to Dr. Arn. Dr. Arn, what's the state of the college? Uh, I'll answer that, but first I want to make two preliminaries. And the first is everybody should know who David is. Uh, David is one of my closest colleagues. There's not any good thing at Hillsdale College that he's not involved in. Uh, we've been carrying on a seminar for 20 years about how to run a college with a lot of people, and David's key, uh, key in them. And so I want you to think of Dave, David as Hugh Hewitt, except highly intelligent and educated man. Hugh Hewitt, but without the talent. That's it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the second is our makeup ladies today are our wives, because we're, of course, minimizing coming to the office. And so I said on the way in here to David, well, for the first time we can say, it's very unusual, we're having a relationship with our makeup lady. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark Waters, who's got lots of Hollywood experience, said, no, that's common. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I'll never live it down. Can you tell we've kept our sense of humor, uh, even if the jokes are not funny? So, okay, my three points, I'm, I'm going to make them pretty quickly, and then we'll just have a question and answer. Uh, first of all, the college is well. Uh, it's inspiring and uh, determined and frustrated, all of those things. Uh, when the coronavirus hit the world, our kids were on spring break. Uh, I regretted that very much. I spent, we spent the whole week trying to understand this thing and bring the kids back. And uh, my first policy complaint about all this is one cannot get the tools to operate and understand, even if it weren't forbidden, which lately it has been, it's forbidden to have college. Uh, and that's too bad because the college is 175 years old and it's been through everything in the world, the Civil War, the Great Wars, Great Depression, three financial pa panics since I've been here. And we never had a day where we didn't have classes. Well, we don't have such a day today because we're having online classes. And uh, we're discovering that uh, two things, the one of them is surprising. We're discovering it's not as good as living here with each other. But we're also discovering that it's pretty good. Uh, we have a lot of experience with online courses. We have 2.2 million last time, 3 million I think it is now, who signed up for the courses. And the rate since this started is three times higher than, it, than the very high rate it's been forever. And so we kind of know how to do that, and we're learning how to do that interactively the way you do with a small group. Uh, there were 50, there were about 150 kids on campus when, that didn't go home for spring break. And uh, I got them together one day when I was trying to figure out how to get college going again. And uh, it was fun. There were, there were about 50 of them in the room, and I talked to them for an hour, and I told them what I know, and I asked them what they know, and then I asked them what should we do. And uh, all but three of them said, we got to get the students back here right now. And I said, well, okay, but what if it makes you sick? And they said, we'll take care of each other. That's what we do. And they were adamant. And so now, uh, you know, yesterday in class, uh, I have, I'm teaching three things this term. Uh, one of them is a, a class way too big. I think there are 36 students in it mm. on Winston Churchill. They're not that big around here. Uh, but it really works. And uh, they had, I think, conspired among, each, among themselves uh, to, br w when they judged the moment was right, to hit me with the fact that we got to get back to college as soon as we can. And certainly we must not be having virtual commencement around here. Because that's not what we do. We got a commencement's a big celebration. It's right after finals. Everybody's exhausted. And of course, it's a big love fest because we all know each other, right? I mean, in my three classes, every one of them has ended on one occasion at least with uh, people calling out, we love you, Dr. Arn, and I call back, I love you too. So it's really great. 
And uh, we're not deluded that it's as good, and we're going to get back to the full work as soon as we can. But we've announced today, not this semester, and uh, we may delay commencement, and if we do, it'll be to August 15th. Uh, because that's the week before uh, school opens, and we can put the seniors where the freshmen not here yet would be, the upperclassmen come back early because we can't beat them away from here with the stick. So there'll be a lot of them around and that'll be good. But we'll put the seniors up and we'll feed them and we'll have parties. And then we'll have a really great commencement. And we'll do that in August if we don't do it on May the 9th. August the 15th or May the 9th. Those are the times. And the college is financially well. Uh, it's a weird college. It's like colleges used to be. Uh, we don't really make much money off the students. Uh, people help. Uh, anybody who ever tried to go make a fortune teaching undergraduates is a fool. Uh, because it's very time consuming to be an undergraduate student in an intense experience like this. And they all work some, or almost all of them do. But mostly they attend to their stu studies and they haven't had time to accumulate a lot of money. And for some reason our cussed parents, who are very generous with the college, also seem to have a lot of children. And so we give a lot of scholarships way around here. And that means that uh, if we had a failure of admissions, which we are very much not having, uh, a joke I like to tell is uh, anytime I meet anybody with an MBA and they ask questions about how would I restructure the college, I always say, well, if you really want to make the margins great, then what you have to do is cancel undergraduate education because we lose our, lose our shirt on that. <laughs> It just turns out we love that. So the first thing is Hillsdale College is great, and it's still very much in the teach the nation build business more now. Uh, the online courses are growing, uh, and I want to say a word about that. Uh, it's something you can do, I urge you to do. Um, our uh, signups for our online, our online courses are running at about three times the rate I don't have the numbers, but it's thousands a day. And of course, those numbers have accumulated to north of 2.3, I think, million now. And uh, we just love that. We think it's the greatest thing in the world. And we put up a bunch of extra ones, and we're hastening some more. And uh, people who want to spend this time productively, and I'll give the same message to you that I give to the students. Uh, it's shameful to waste a day. You know, the, young, the students, they're young and they're promising and they're smart. And they need to spend this time actively. And so the challenge around here, everybody's got to work every day, all the time. And they really do respond to that. They show up for class ready, just like they do when they're here. Well, we should all do that too, right? Use this to improve oneself and one's neighbors and the country. And one way to do it is to take or study those online courses and refer other people to them. Uh, because in the end, what's wrong here is a misunderstanding in this country. Uh, a good thing elevated beyond its worth. But I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, the next thing I can say is uh, we have these 22 charter schools. And uh, we stay close to them. And so uh, the people who run that, uh, Dr. O'Toole and others, they just went crazy. They've, uh, they've got all those schools. They have conference calls and Zoom meetings, Zoom meetings. You guys have those? Hmm. We have them out the bazoo. Uh, with, they had 50 school leaders on one uh, last Friday. How to do online learning the best. And they've got them reading their Greek and their Latin, and they've got them reading the classics, and they've got them working their math problems. And the kids are taught, you got to move, right? This is precious time. Use it. And they do. And uh, we're developing a lot more tools for that, including for homeschoolers, because uh, we want people to learn. We're in the world conquest business, and we have just one weapon, teaching and learning. So. That's a big thing, and that's we're soon to start a master's of classical education program around here. And uh, that was actually David's idea. David has ideas once in a while. Uh, expensive and, ones. Yeah, expensive <laughs> ideas, yeah. And uh, it is a great idea. Why? Because with the education we are, offer here, 
graduate and undergraduate, what we're doing is we're seeding the nation. You know, there are very important people in politics and business and law and medicine and science and higher education in all forms who graduated from Hillsdale College since I've been here. And they're all becoming famous and telling me what to, telling me what to do now. I, 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 and they'll always be kids to me. And I'll always be their teacher, although some of them are powerful and recognizable names. So I love them, and, uh, and we want to make more of them. And so the Master of Classical Education Project is partly to make more school leaders and teachers for schools. And uh, we're going to do an online version of that. You'll be able to enroll in that. Uh, we don't know about the economics of it yet, but I, I can promise you it'll be cheap. And uh, uh, we're going to expand that. And that's an exciting thing that's uh, come upon us just in the last two weeks. So there's a blessing there. And the last thing I'll say is uh, I have a complaint about all this. And it's built from a misunderstanding that's th at the heart of the revolution in the government today. We think that complex things in practical and civic action can be decided through expertise. I, I'll give you an example of it. There's a, uh, a brilliant New York Times article today about another Trump scandal. Trump is doing the radical thing of recommending that they hurry and approve this malaria medicine that has been successful wherever it's been tried. No, there haven't been uh, clinical trials, you know, all that, right? But heck fire, people are dying. And so Trump, against the advice of his experts, keeps recommending this thing. And so today the New York Times has discovered that Donald Trump owns stock in the company that makes that drug, one of the French companies. And the amount of stock he owns, they, they couldn't nail, nail it down for certain, but its, its value is between $100 and $1,500. <laughs> that's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> Isn't that great? And uh, wow, and that's in the New York Times. I, it's, what does that mean? It's, they, there must be some corruption, they think, that explains him not just simply letting the experts rule. But I want to explain to you why that won't work. It, it, it also can't work. There are logical reasons it can't work. Uh, to become a leading expert in uh, immunology or epidemiology, those are words that go around a lot now. We have a big uh, virologist on our, in our student body, the great Silas Johnson. He knows a lot. And uh, he's a graduate of Hillstock College and then University of Michigan PhD. He was a football player and a very good football player, although the coach says, he did the uh, dumbest thing on a football, he's the smartest boy I ever saw on our football team, and he did the dumbest thing on a football field that I've ever seen, which was kick his helmet in joy that almost cost us a game. Didn't know. <laughs> anyway, Silas, right, he's an expert, right? And for Silas to be an expert, Silas is probably getting close to 40 years old now, and he's been focused on this hard since he was 18, right? And that means he knows that, right? But there isn't any single expertise that can tell us what to do about this. Uh, uh, and if you have such an expertise, by definition, you don't have many of them. So there's a, you know, and, and it doesn't, things don't work that way. You're, yourself, when you, every time you make a judgment, see, I teach Aristotle and Winston Churchill, and I can give you examples from them. But start with an economist. Uh, Brian Westbury is very brilliant economist. Uh, you can read him for free every Monday afternoon on Monday Morning Outlook. He usually doesn't get it up in the morning, but sometime by 2 o'clock, it's almost always up there. It's free. And he writes today that there are, well, last Monday, yesterday, I guess, he writes that there are 30 million small businesses in America. And his prediction, and his predictions have been very good, they're always data-based, is that if we open by Easter, we're going to lose 3% of them. That's almost a million. If we wait till May uh, 15th, uh, sorry, to uh, uh, May the 1st, that's right, 
till the end of the month, this month, we're going to lose 8% of it. Mm. And if we wait until uh, the end of May, we're going to lose 15% of it. Think of that. That's 3 million businesses and all of the people involved. And then he goes on to comment that the suicide rates measured in America for a long time are the highest in history during the Great Depression. Lives are at stake. Now, it would actually be impossible for somebody to have enough expertise. It'd be, let's put it this way, not impossible, extremely rare for somebody to have as much expertise in economics as Brian Westbury and as much expertise in disease as Mr. Fauci, the very capable big wheel in the CDC. But to have five of those, nobody can have that. And that means something has to arbitrate among the expertises, right? Uh, Aristotle writes, uh, the architect, we like architecture around here. Uh, my younger daughter is a classical architect, and wow, am I not proud of her. And, uh, and uh, those, th that word architect, Aristotle writes that uh, the architect doesn't know as much about bricklaying as the bricklayer. And when it comes to a matter purely of bricklaying, the bricklayer is the one to say. But somebody has to direct, direct all the arts toward the completion of the building. And that word architect is extremely interesting because it comes from two Greek words. And one of them, arche, means uh, we get archaeology and architecture from that word. Uh, in the Gospel of John, John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, in he arche is how it begins. Uh, arche means beginning. It's like the word principle in Latin. Principle means the way a thing starts. And however things thing starts, if it is to continue to be that thing, then the way it starts is the essence of the thing, too. So RK is ruling principle. Techne is making stuff. Uh, technology comes from that word. It means art. And art just means, in the broad sense, just whatever human beings make. And so that means that architecture is the ruling art as regards building. Then the question is, what would be the ruling art in s civic affairs? Well, come to find out that's statesmanship, which is a high exercise of a faculty we all use every day and have by nature. That faculty is practical judgment or prudence. And what we do by prudence is we pick our way among conflicting information and incomplete information and rapidly changing circumstances and we choose what to do, never perfectly. We're not God or angels. And people who are good at that, they are not experts. They are just exercising one hopes well, particularly well, a virtue that we all have as human. Now, who gets to exercise that in this country? The answer to that is the clearest possible thing. It's the one we elect to do it. And the one we elect to do it is empowered by us, and we are entitled to do that because we are created equal and may not be governed except with our consent. Churchill, they always said about Churchill about the generals, you know, you just have to listen to the generals. Well, he did all the time. You do have to listen to experts. You do have to listen to the people from the CDC. But on the other hand, they don't know enough, and they can't possibly know enough according to their expertise to actually judge whether we shut down the whole country and for how long. They can't say. They can't. They, nobody can, right? It's, it's a judgment, and it affects people profoundly, and we have a system. And so this... Uh, uh, Churchill had a joke, he would say, war is too, impor too important to be left to the generals. But of course he did listen to them. He wrote it one of them one time, and this is the one, one of the ones he liked. He said, I knew that if he would not do it for me, it could not be done. And he knew that it, I would not make him do it if it could not be done. You see? But of course the judgment has to be left 
to the statesman, to the appointed person by the sovereign, us, right? Uh, generals in the First World War in Britain had a lot of power, and the politicians couldn't stand up to them. And they lost 900 and some thousand men to death. Going across the trenches, on one day in Passchendaele, they lost 10,000, and they moved the front a couple hundred yards, and the Germans took it back the next day. That's something more than a military decision. That's a political decision. And that means we have a right to have input into it, and we have a mechanism to have it. <laughs> so my own view is, I don't know whether this is necessary or not. I try to find out every day, because I want to bring the students back, and will, the minute I can. Uh, the, when, the minute it's legal, alas, that's a problem. And also, I can be confident that the kids are not going to die. Because that's my lookout, right? I'm responsible f for their learning, and for them to keep learning, they have to be alive. So I'm going to try not to kill them. But I want to bring them back. And the shutting down the economy, uh, I, I like it that the president and many of his people are reluctant about it and impatient with it, although they're doing it. And I dislike it when anybody who's in the federal bureaucracy, which, by the way, makes laws now and operates in the name of expertise, which is a log as a logical fact cannot be sufficient. I don't like it when they don't show reluctance about this, when they don't realize that they're making judgments about things that they don't know and can't know. So that part of it, and the media, God's sake, I mean, it's crazy how they act. So uh, those are my three points, the college as well, and we'll talk a bit further. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You've touched on a lot of things that our, our viewers have sent in some questions about, so we might, we might circle back uh, to those a little bit later. But, but first, you remind me of, of uh, the old adage to a hammer, uh, concerning the expert, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, an expert, when asked what's the solution to this problem, is going to think in terms of the, the, the expert's perspective on the problem, which won't, by, as you say, definition, take everything into account. Um, uh, what, what, um, what would you say, we, we've had a lot of questions concerning the relationship of the federal government to the states to the issue of federalism, uh, it's in the headlines. Uh, uh, they're, they're, the, some of the states seem to be squabbling with the federal government about things. Um, how, what is all that, how does all that strike you? And, and, and does this kind of uh, back and forth between the federal government and the state strike you as a good thing, bad thing, indifferent? Uh, how, should, how might we think about that? Well, uh, first of all, that's constitutional. That's how the country is right. formed. It's sort of bottom-up country, right? We made the Constitution the only law we ever passed. We uh, delegate our sovereign authority, which only people can have. No government can ever have it. Uh, some to the states and some to the federal government. And that uh, plan, that mechanism, that structure is what James Madison says is the most important thing about the Constitution, the separation of powers among the levels of government and the separation of power, that's vertical, and the separation of powers horizontally in the government. So the great thing you get, I mean, because first of all, isn't it obvious that nobody can be sure what to do about this? It's becoming surer with every passing day. But like, here's a big question that's of extreme importance to me. Why are some young people dying from this thing? 30-year-olds. I don't know about any 20-year-olds, but I think I've been told there are some. I don't really know any 30-year-olds who've died. But most people who get it, they have a mild case. And flu, generally, is not very dangerous to the young. Why is this one? Well, it attacks the lungs. It's a very serious thing. If it gets in your lungs, and then your immune system fills your lungs up with stuff, I'm told. Uh, and you can die from that. That's why you need a ventilator. Um, but why does it affect some young people and not others? Nobody knows that, right? And that means that in a place where we do not know, then you have to try things. And you know, it's, there's one thing that's certain in this whole thing, and that is most people have enough money 
to live for a month or two, right? And that means without income, those people are going to run out of money in weeks, not months. And that's certain, right? So in a situation where you're certainly going to encounter that cost, then the idea that one state does it a little different than the other and measures the results, right. Right. that produces data. Right. And that means you're not going to make one overall huge mistake, although we kind of are. Maybe, I don't know, I don't know. But another thing is, if a state shows what works, the others are going to be quick to, comp to copy it because they're all elected and they've all got c citizens and those citizens read the paper. Well, they don't read the paper enough. They watch TV too much. But um, so anyway, yeah, I think that's how it's supposed to be. So, so we, we, we have a question here via email from uh, a Tim Teary. Uh, that touches on this as well. Do you think the, what about the $2 trillion bailout? Is that, is that overreach? Is that a prudential call suitable for the moment? What, what, what do you make of that? Well, uh, you know, there's a fair amount of money in it that doesn't have anything to do with this. <laughs> um, and that's pretty bad. Um, uh, certainly people who lose their jobs and go broke because of this they need to be helped and sufficiently helped so they can put their lives back together in a hurry. In the Second World War, a lot of people got their houses bombed. More people didn't. And so the public paid for the houses of the ones who did. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's right. That part of the bailout is fine to me. And then uh, Art Laffer, who's a buddy of mine and a really great economist, his idea was that we should just uh, suspend all payments into the federal entitlement programs till the end of the year, which gives everybody right away a 8 to 15 percent raise. And, uh, and uh, you know, ta he believes in tax cuts. I do too. And they have been working, I think, in this economy in recent years. So that, that's a feature that could have been thought of. And then hmm. uh, guaranteeing, you don't want the financial system to freeze up. And they appear to have stopped that so far, at least. And that's what happened in 2008. Uh, we just had some accounting rules, actually, that bankrupted healthy companies in 24 hours. Mm. You know, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns and all them. And, uh, and uh, we don't do that anymore. But supplying credit to the economy so it can adjust and operate, that's a good thing. So those parts of it. But, Lord, some of it. Uh, right, right. It was... Um, an opportunity that some couldn't resist, wasn't it, mm -hmm. uh, to, to lard their favorite programs. Um, let's pull, pull the lens back a little bit and ask about uh, the U.S. government more, more broadly. We have a question from uh, Mary Russell. This is from Houston. Um, historically, times of uncertainty have resulted in significant political or governmental change. Do you, do you see the current situation changing the U.S. government much? Well, uh, we know the terms of the controversy. Yeah, we know, to use Lincoln's language, the two parts into which the House is divided. There's a constitutional part, finding sovereignty in the nature of each human being. And there's the expertise part. Right which empowers the federal bureaucracy that finds sovereignty in the one who knows scientific things. Right. Uh, so this controversy over this, the political controversy about the coronavirus, it's broken out along those lines. Who's the president to say? Right. Right. And it, it is, by the way, exactly like the controversies in war. Who's the president to say? Let the generals say. Right? Well, they should say, but they should say to the president, and he's going to bear responsibility. So the point is, it's like that. And how is this going to break out? Well, we're in the middle. We've been in the middle. We, we've, what I think is, I think that this controversy was born in things that were brought into America in the late 19th century, and they became a significant fixture in the American government in the 60s. 19, some somewhat earlier, but especially in the 1960s. If you want to 
see what I'm talking about, just go look around Washington, D.C., or watch a video of it. And you'll see that there's a lot of beautiful buildings, and they all look ra rather the same. And there's a lot of ugly buildings, and they look in a wide variety of ways. But they have in common that they're mostly pretty ugly. <laughs> those are all the unconstitutional things. And those were all built since, mostly built since 1960. So, so I think, you know, and when you're in the middle of a great battle like this, it's hard to know how it's going to come out, right? you know. George Washington didn't know, and Abraham Lincoln didn't know, and Winston Churchill didn't know, and we don't know. Well, there are probably, unfortunately, probably people in uh, some important positions who hope the government changes uh, rather dramatically. You know, the old uh, never put an emergency or a crisis, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of people who would like to see things change and perhaps not for the better. Um, a number of our, our viewers are wondering about the, this, this pressure for centralized, concerted governmental control over every aspect of the crisis, from medical production to testing to approvals and distribution of, of federal largesse. Uh, they're wondering, if, if is, is this de facto a big step towards socialism? Or is the country going to become habituated to a kind of centralized economy? Well, some people will say what they are saying, and that is, in a world like ours today, where everything is one and disease can spread globally forever, uh, make the same argument about the existence of nuclear weapons, make the same argument about everything that's in modern, and make the same argument about the prevalence of smartphones, and, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then, in a world like that, it's too complex for ordinary people right. to figure out. Uh, that's arguments being made now, right? And then there are other people who say, yeah, okay. That mean you get to tell me what to do all the time? Because who are you? Because, you know, remember Madison, if men were angels, no government would be needed if angels were to govern men. And see, I'm not saying that the people in the federal bureaucracy, including the one that I've named, is a bad person. I have reason to believe he's a very fine person. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying he's not an angel. Right. And, and, uh, and that is all one really needs to prove. Um, so, and how's it going to play out? Well, there's going to be a great struggle. Uh, here's a fact that I, uh, uh, we looked up, a bunch of us looked it up. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control, and the statute that created it, signed by Harry Truman, was organized to um, uh, work on communicable diseases. Well, it spends enormous amounts of money now on obesity, on chronic conditions. And that means it's attempting to manage our day-to-day -day health. Whereas, you know, there are lots of agencies that are supposed to do that, and especially the state governments are supposed to do that. I mean, help us with it, because, by the way, the single most important person to determine your health would be you, of course. And, uh, and so, you know, they've, there's re overreach here, big time. Yeah. And is it because they were distracted that right now, today, people in Hillsdale County, you know, this is rural part of the world. It's a great part of the world, by the way. Come see us. Uh, when you're allowed. Um, there are people with symptoms. Uh, a spouse of a, of a senior management of the college has got symptoms. He's recovered now. They're pretty sure he had it, but they didn't have a test to give him. Whereas in, so now there are tests coming this week, but we've shut the economy down for two weeks and maybe three and maybe four, right? So why didn't we have those tests? Uh, I'm told that uh, they were depleted in the swine flu, which was in 19, I can't remember when it was, 20 or 30 years ago. And, uh, and they've not been restored uh, because of permitting problems and like, why don't we have more ventilators? You know, I'm trying to buy ventilators. I've, we've got an order in for four ventilators. Months. Yeah, yeah, months. We can get them in August, we think. I, uh, uh, 
you know, I thought, you know, somebody might die and there might not be a ventilator. I thought the common sense thing, let's buy a ventilator. Mm -hmm. sure. And they said, would we know how to work one? And I said, no, we wouldn't. We'd have to call somebody and ask them. Let's come to find out it's not that hard. And uh, my one thought I had that's a really great thought is the maintenance department here can fix anything. I thought, take them down there and say, just figure out how these work, you know? Because, look, it's, of course, that's terribly irresponsible, isn't it? On the other hand, if you got somebody dying right there and you need a ventilator, stick them on the ventilator, right? Get a doctor to help you. I'm a doctor, just the wrong kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the uh, that's, that's right. I, I, I worry sometimes that the... Uh, under the constant barrage of this, this sort of um, uh, adulation of the expert order, ordinary people will gradually despair of their ability to govern themselves, their ability to, to uh, determine or run their own lives. Um, uh, I, think, I think that's what uh, some of these questions are about. There's a fear that people are just despairing of their ability to manage their affairs, and I'll just let the government manage my affairs for me. I think that's what is behind some of these questions. But we have another one, um, a little bit more particular, changing the focus a bit. Uh, this is from C. Philip Lundell, Georgetown, who wonders about China. How do you see our relationship with China changing? Do you think we'll be able to maintain an economic advantage? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, isn't China admirable? Uh, Senator Cotton, who happens to be a friend of mine, uh, in the middle of the impeachment hearings gave a speech and said that this virus started in China in, on December the 1st, and they started telling the world about it on December 30th. And ever since then, all the great and near great in the establishments of various countries have been congratulating them on their transparency. <laughs> uh, a doctor in China and a journalist in China who complained about them covering things up are not to be found, can't be contacted. Well, I don't know what happened, but I do know that the Chinese government has the power to do that. Yeah. I mean, if you, get, if you get hauled up before a Chinese court, you can't be confident that the case will be decided on its merits, right? Maybe it will, but if somebody doesn't want it to, it won't be. So that's China. Right, and, and uh, um, they clam, you know, I, I ab abhor these arguments, articles, there are, pl there are many of them, that say that they have a big advantage over us. They can tell people what to do. And, you know, that's not the way for people to live. And uh, democratic and free society is very messy, but gosh, can it not achieve a lot? And that's, you know, my key complaint about the bureaucracy is they should be thinking how to empower us to do our jobs and to help. Like, I need tools. I've been seeing masks, cleaners, purifiers, ventilators, whatever, right? Uh, we need those things, right? We're going to have a stock up next time. You know, I was always preparing for the last war, of course. But the people who study this kind of thing they should have that stuff ready. Yep. And then we, because, you, know, uh, you know, in our various plans to bring the students back, uh, the student affairs people said once, we don't have enough people to marshal all this and organize everybody. One of them said that. And I said, sure we do. <laughs> and they said, well, we only have like four or something. I said, no, we have 1,504. Every student can help and will help if you ask them. And they're pretty smart. Eager to help. Right? Yeah, so help. that's yeah. the power, right? That's what we could do. But we should be thinking all the time. How do, how do, the reason we have these agencies is to calculate things like this so that everybody can get involved and help when the time comes. That's, what the, that's how they won the Second World War in Britain. That's how they dealt with the bombing. That's how they put out the fires. That's, you know, everybody was a soldier. And the Germans, very organized, could not in the end stand up to them. Centrally organized, top down, not bottom up. I saw a headline 
just today that, that uh, in Britain, over 700,000 people have volunteered to help their neighbors by getting groceries for them, the neighbors who, who are um, um, elderly perhaps aren't able to get to the stores or don't want to get to the stores. So the, it's, it's like World War II all over again. You know, yeah. Everybody's helping everybody else rather than being isolated. And that's significantly larger than the British Army, Army that mm -hmm. part of it. It's almost as large as the United States Army on active duty. Right. Right? right. And right. where'd they come from? And who's getting them paid? It, uh, it's like Lincoln said about, you know, how many jobs are there? It, he's arguing against slavery. He says, God made every man with a mouth and a hands and a head. The implication being that the head should guide the hands in the feeding of the mouth. In other words, we're supposed to figure out how the people can help. Right. And it's a special problem if they're contagious to each other. Well, figure that out as rapidly as possible and get people back to work, including helping other people. Do you know, in Michigan, uh, non-essential surgeries have been banned, and uh, the local hospital is laying off people. I don't know if they'd like me telling you this, who do those surgeries. And apparently, those people can't be of any use in fighting the coronavirus, and the hospitals are running out of money. Well, wow, that's medical people being sent home. I, th I hear, that I read that that's happening in New York, too. Oh, gee. It defies any kind of reason. Um, so everybody's isolated. Everybody's at home. Everyone's told to shelter in place as if it's some kind of a tornado or a, an air raid. Uh, and, and that means that all kinds of activity has moved online. Um, this is changing focus a little bit. Uh, a lot of activity here at the college has moved online. Will this, do you, do you think that this surge of activity online, especially online educational activity, all kinds of K-12 people all over the country in ordinary schools are now at home learning online. Uh, do you think that's going, this, this is gonna spur the creation of more homeschooling programs? Do you think, do you think charter schools are going to uh, be uh, spurred on and promoted by uh, uh, the reaction to this, this event? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, there's these fundamental things. Uh, like I, if there are such things as uh, elements of nature, then they cannot be repealed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, the students at Hillsdale College know each other extremely closely. Mm -hmm. And they miss each other, <laughs> although they're talking every day. Right? So, it's better. We have these bodies. I was in a conference one time, and some guy who was a big believer in the tech. And look at us, you know. I'm like a techie guy. I got every. If there's a computer, every gadget. Every if, the, if the computer they make it is any good, and I, I own that dang thing. <laughs> and uh, everybody tries to stay close to me because I get tired of them and give them away. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, I was in this conference, and this national author said, well, when we're all living in the cyber world, and I said, anybody else getting hungry? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're not going to live in it. Now, I, I'll tell you something we, we know about education. I've learned this partly from David. Um, the best way to learn is a few people with a common object to know a common thing. And of course, the best things to know are the eternal things, the elevated things, the things that you, once you know them, you always know them. Uh, and the best way to do that is in small groups. And uh, David wrote his doctoral thesis on uh, the idea of university by John Henry Newman. And he told me, and I looked up the passage the other day, uh, that Newman wrote, Newman was a, you know, a college professor. Uh, he wrote that uh, if you had to do without either of two things, the faculty, or the relationships among the students, get rid of the faculty. <laughs> and I will tell you, David, I've thought of it. <laughs> but, uh, Especially when I'm bugging you. Yeah, but, it's, uh, but see, in other words, you can't replace that in mass, right? You can uh, alter the geographic problem in some respects. But still, if you want to have, so our online courses are everybody watch a video and send us questions and take an exam. We're elaborating them now 
eventually we're going to be off. We're, we're doing some experiments right now. We're going to offer seminars. But that's labor intensive, right? Because if you have 100 people, it's not a seminar. Mm -hmm. 36 in my class stretches the outer boundary. Yeah, and uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a certain kind of show pony, so I can mostly keep them together. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but it's not as good, no. right? No. So the point is, reading a book is great. Watching an online course is great. Uh, going to school and sitting with the teacher and talking a lot with other people learning the same thing is the peak existence. Mm -hmm. And if you just look at the way K through 12 education works in America, everybody can have that. We're spending the money. We're mostly just not doing it right. So I don't see that disappearing, mm -hmm. although for sure. I once said to David, David's a very good teacher. Everybody, everybody loves David around here, except David, maybe. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes his wife, Janet. Um, <laughs> he, he, uh, uh, and uh, I said to him, because I challenged him, because we've been talking this stuff six ways to Sunday forever now. And I said, OK, why don't we take the best lecture you ever gave on John Henry Newman, an important man, and David's one of the people who knows the most about him in the world. And why don't we just tape that and show that, rather than some, you know, inferior person talking about him. And David said, the best lecture I ever gave about John Henry Newman, I gave in response to a question. Now think about that for a minute. See what that means? I, I've learned this myself. Students, every time they open their mouth, they teach you something every time something about themselves what they know and they don't know something about you what you know and you don't know and if you answer a question and you listen to the question and answer it then you are giving them the information that their mind is ready to understand you see and they back at you right and that that is the phenomenon we know as talking <laughs> which is the human gift Nothing's going to repeal that, although online has great potential for good. What about the uh, college's efforts to help charter schools and also private schools? What, uh, tell us a little bit. I know probably a lot of viewers know a good bit about that already, but some probably don't. How, how is the college in the sort of K-12 business? Well, that's a crazy idea. I confess it was my <laughs> idea. Uh, so we don't take any money from the government, and that means that we don't take any money from a charter school. And I said, OK, let's go into the charter school business. <laughs> and how would we do that? Well, what we do is we help people found a school in the States. There are 22 of them, I think, right now. And, and uh, our relationships with them have been successful in all but two cases. Uh, and that's, you know, that happens. You know, who cares? God bless them and have a great school. But what we do is help them get a charter, and then we give them a curriculum, which, by the way, over time, they help to improve and build. It's a huge engine of school reform now. Uh, they get invited up here. They come, you know, five and six hundred teachers in the summer. And they spend a week here. It's kind of like resort living, because Hillsdale College is pretty nice, and it's really, the weather's really good in the summer. You know, the rest of us have to face the rigors, which makes us better people. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, they're in this atmosphere of high learning, and they're contributing to it, and they just love it. And we don't charge them a nickel for that, because they can't give us any money. And, you know, we're tempted, but no way. So anyway, that's how it works. And, and what, what I love about the idea, and the great test has always been, will it work? Because the contract we have with them really just says, I mean, there are details in it, but it basically just says, if you'll agree to do what we say and work with us, to help us say better, we'll agree to tell you what to do. <laughs> and it'll be a pain to both of us, and we'll benefit from it. So that's the way it works. And it is, you know, I like that word, inspiring. Mm. Uh, uh, the head of the Barney Project uh, is Dr. O'Toole. And uh, she said to me the other day, she said, uh, 
I, I happen to be her father. She said, uh, Dad, there's another great kindergarten. She won't like me saying this, kindergarten teacher. And I said, no way. Why? Because the greatest teacher in America is a woman named Mrs. Raritan in the Leander Classical Academy School. And you haven't seen teaching until you watched her teach phonics. To these little wigglers who are kindergarten <laughs> teachers, right? Wigglers. And just, it's just tremendous, right? It's just awesome. And people who are good at that, that's a high skill. That's, that's, you know, and it comes out of love and a big heart and an excellent mind. So anyway, yeah, that, you know, get to know that woman. I mean, I've turned her into a tourist attraction. If you go to Leander outside Austin, Texas, just go to the front office and say you'd like to visit Mrs. Raritan's class. And whatever's going on in there, I promise you it will be inspiring. That's great. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. Well, speaking of wiggling, well, granting that, that um, there's a lot that the college does for K-12 education and the charter schools and, and in private schools, too, granting that, we're getting a lot of questions just now. Maybe these are cries for help. Uh, <laughs> from parents who are suddenly stuck homeschooling. Um, uh, does the college have any thoughts about, about um, extending the, the Barney Charter School curricular things in a, in a sort of homeschooling direction? I don't mean turning all efforts that way. I just mean making those things available and packaging them in ways that could be of, of help to homeschool. Yeah, so we're working on that right now. And we have, s some things have been developed in the last week. If you go to our website, you can find them. Um, and uh, here's what we want to do. Uh, because we believe, by the way, that, that the most effective uh, kind of education involves a teacher, some fellow students, in the right proportions, uh, we're not going to abandon our love of school in all its good forms. But homeschooling can really work. And mom's the teacher, or dad's the teacher. And, uh, so we want to help them, you know, lay out a curriculum. We have a curriculum. We're improving it a lot lately. And, and then materials to teach from. And then we're going to make videos. Uh, uh, we're making a lot of videos for K through 12 education in, in charter schools and public. Anybody wants to use them. But we're targeting them at school leaders, teachers, and then parents and homeschool thing. And then... You know, like, there's a guy, you know, the time is going to come when you're going to have to read Shakespeare. And the time is going to come when you're going to have to teach calculus. There are people who are really good at that. So we're going to get them to help you learn how to do it. That's, that's great. The, um, this is a question related to this topic, uh, although I'm, I'm wondering if the question is targeting the college level rather than K-12 uh, K now. This, uh, this is from Richard Non, Lawrenceville, Georgia. Uh, this is through email. He asks if uh, because the college is uniquely positioned for, seems to be uniquely uh, positioned for distance learning, online learning, do you see this type of learning expanding in the future for Hillsdale? Uh, that, that may pertain to K-12. You've already answered that, but what about at the college level? Well, yeah, we, I don't know. Um, I guess the answer to that is sure. Um, we want to, uh, you know, our students are, you know, they're jealous. You know, <laughs> they, they, they have now come to understand that we're going to teach everybody in the country that we can. But this has to be really special. And, you know, it better be because it costs a fortune. Uh, but uh, <laughs> It can't help. <laughs> it can't it help is, it be. Is special. It's remarkable. It's, uh, and, it's remarkable. and so we don't pretend that we can emulate that online. Well, we can emulate it. We, don't, we can't match that online. And so we imagine a Hillsdale College like this Master's of Classical Education with online courses for credit leading to a master's degree. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to do that as soon as we can. Right. Um, but then undergraduate, well, we'll see. Uh, people keep trying to give us remote locations. And there's one in California. And if it works, one of Whalen's ideas, Whalen has lots of ideas, uh, is we might teach just the first two years the core curriculum in a little college out there. And then the ones who are ambitious could try to come here or carry on their education some other way mm -hmm. and get an associate's degree, it's called. So, we, you know, we'll, uh, 
some years ago, under pressure of request, uh, I came and, you know, we have budgets and we have goals and we have plans and we have to have all that or we'd go broke, which we're not going to do, by the way. Um, and I came and I, I, I met this inspiring guy who'd started a private school, and I heard about it, and he talked about Hillsdale all the time. And I said to somebody I know, who knew him, I said, do you know that guy? Oh, yeah, I know him. And I said, well, is he a really good guy? And they said, sure. Why do you ask? And I said, well, I think he's going around using our name. <laughs> I wonder if he's an axe murderer. <laughs> well, the guy showed up in my office. He heard about this, and he just... Oh, no, we would never do, we don't use your name. You're too great for that. You know, it's just lovely what he was saying. And I heard it all, and I said, would you like to be endorsed by us? And he just jumped in his seat and said, I'll do anything. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll think about it. So I go to a meeting, and David is there, and I'm saying, you know, maybe we should do private schools. And they're all saying, well, we've got these charter schools. We've got to make that work. That's the way you always talk. And I said, yeah, I know. And David said, you're changing your mind about something. And I said, I am. What's that? We are going to attempt to find a way to teach everyone who wants to learn with us. Yep. We're going to try. You want to learn from us? We will try. I think that, that uh, answers a follow-up along this line as well. Um, do we intend to produce more courses for the general public, like the recent American history course that Wilfred McClay um, uh, recorded with us? And the answer is an emphatic yes, yes, and yes again. Yeah, it, uh, maybe we have an advantage, we think we do, because we have this intense experience with these 1,500 young people, and they, you know, they come up in their, what are they, their uh, figures of fun. They're freshmen, you know. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't haze them exactly except I kind of do. <laughs> but um, well, one man hazing up. That's right, you know. <laughs> but, you know, but when they leave, wow. And they grow up really fast. And they're very determined. So the point is, we have that experience. And we think we know what makes that happen. It takes a lot of us. And it takes a lot of disciplines, cooperating through a core especially. So the thing is, why don't we reproduce that for anybody who wants to do it? Why don't we, you know, there are, I think the number might be 40,000 people who've taken all of our online courses mm -hmm. and taken all the exams and passed them all. Well, those are students, right? So why don't we orient this so that it's like the college catalog of Hillsdale College, that it reproduces the whole core and that there are even advanced courses and disciplines that people can pick, like they pick majors here at the college. Right. Why don't we reproduce all that and give it to people? Right. And so that's where we're going. And I will tell you that uh, Kyle Mernon, who's uh, either going to finish his PhD and become a great man, or I'm going to kill him. He's uh, my boy, sort of. I've raised him from a pup, as I like to say. <laughs> He's very talented. He's young and stupid still. But he, he's in charge of all that now. And I think he's going to do great things with it. That's great. That's great. We, um, I was just told via this magic screen here that we have thousands of people right now uh, watching from Facebook and our website. Uh, that's just a remarkable, a remarkable number. I'm, I'm very glad you're here. I, I hope we're addressing uh, questions or at least thoughts that, that you may have had about the college, of course, and um, its role with respect to our particular uh, uh, circumstances, the, the crisis that afflicts the whole world right now. Um, um, so thank you. Cliff Van Handel uh, via email is asking a very a big pull the lens back question. What are your thoughts about how things are going to look. Maybe not crystal ball predictions, but what do you hope and what do you perhaps worry about the world looking like after this passes, this coronavirus episode passes? How is it going to affect work, interactions, the culture? What do you, what do you worry about? What do you hope for? 
Well, there's an election in November, and that's a very significant thing, and it's going to have a enormous impact on the intermediate future, not just immediate. So a lot depends on how that goes. Right. Um, uh, if if uh, you know, and there are these two claims. I think the situation is clear enough. Uh, you know, I mean, it's very confused in a thousand ways, but and very complicated. But in another way, it's clear enough. Are we loyal to the forms of constitutional rule and the principles in the Declaration of Independence that justify them? And so I see one future if we return to all that, mm -hmm. and a different future if we don't. And look, it, it, it's just true, by the way. You have, to, you have to sort of take a breath and understand how serious this is. It, it's almost crazy to suggest that it's not inevitable that we're going to go further down the road the way we're going. Because these ideas grew up in the 19th century in Germany, and they have only gone from strength to strength. And all of Europe, China itself, right? China is not really a Marxist state anymore. It's a bureaucratic state ruled by experts who do turn out to be human beings and not ought, angels. Ought not to have that power, right? <laughs> anyway, the point is maybe that's just going to sweep. And I teach these uh, totalitarian novels, I'm teaching it next fall. Uh, read Brave New World, a pleasant totalitarian future. Read 1984 and Darkness at Noon, grim totalitarian futures. Maybe it's Brave New World, although I fear the grim one more. Or maybe we can have what Lincoln proposed. Again, a new birth of freedom. And that'll make the world more prosperous, with more opportunity. And then, alas, that world, too, will be imperfect. Right. Well, there's a lot riding on the <coughs> not-so-distant future, isn't there? Yeah. This, um, it uh, won't be, by the way, whatever is said in November need not be final. Can't be final. It can't be, right? right. Yeah, right. that's right. Well, uh, David just made an uh, eschatological point. <laughs> um, but it, it, can't, it, it, it need not be and cannot be because... If you think, I mean, it, it makes you a terribly stubborn person, I'm afraid, to study the things we study here, right? Because we've encountered real greatness. Right. And uh, why did Churchill think, almost without resources, that he could beat the Germans? Right, right. Utterly hopeless. And, and the reason is, he thought, that can't work, what they're doing. Right. And therefore, it won't work. It doesn't satisfy the needs of human beings. Uh, I'll quote this. It's maybe the most important passage in all of Winston Churchill. It's in an essay called 50 Years Hence. Uh, by the way, is my, I met my wife, who's here today, but I can't get her to come out here. Um, uh, working on the Churchill biography in Oxford, England. She's a nice English lady. Um, I'll say sometimes, you know, Winston Churchill was pretty good. And she always says, you've said that, dear. <laughs> well, he, he writes a paragraph that goes this way in that book, predicting the future in 50 years. He says, uh, he predicted, by the way, nuclear bombs and stuff, a long time before, rockets, a long time before they came. Mm. But that's not what's interesting about it. He said, uh, imagine a world 16 generations from now where people can live as long as they want where people can go anywhere they want to, including interplanetary. Mm -hmm. uh, where people enjoy pleasures much wider than any we know. Immortality. And then he says, what would be the good of all that to them? What would they know more than we know about the simple questions posed by human life why are we here? What are we for? How should we be? Right. right? And nothing that doesn't address those questions can bring comfort to our souls. And that means, in the end, 
I argue, despite every evidence, despite, despite the mighty power of it, despite, despite the overwhelming momentum behind it, I argue it won't work. Mm -hmm. It can't work, and so it won't work. Well, it's contrary to nature. It's contrary to human nature, so it can't be sustainable, not over time. That's right. That's uh, human, That's nature, right. human nature may be broken in some ways, but it is still native to us. There, there's a, you remind me of a, a remark, a very insightful remark of uh, T.S. Eliot's. There, there are no lost causes because there are no one causes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so so yeah. Yeah, that's, that's Churchill in World War II. You know, you, you, there seems to be no reason for hope, but this cannot uh, uh, remain, this cannot endure. We have to overcome this. So. Uh, people, I bet people on this call, by the way, I bet you've got a pool going now. When is this guy going to shut up? Um, but um, people on this call, that, that what they're probably like is they don't think that life can be made angelic. Mm. In fact, it's not the life to which we're called, except later maybe. Uh, life is a struggle. We have to confront things. And in the way we confront them, and by the way, uh, this is in Aristotle, every wolf and every dog and every cat has to struggle against necessity mm -hmm. and suffer pains and feel pleasure. The different thing about us is we can stand outside those and judge how we react to them. And survival alone right. is not good enough for us. Right. To do something shameful makes you want to die. And so that, that means that it's one of the reasons it can't be uh, there are two, the two sides of the same coin I think. One is we can contemplate the eternal and the divine. We can feel the slight approval of things eternal and divine. And we long for that. Uh, if you ever put an argument together that leads somewhere serious with a bunch of people, I'll tell you this is an experience I've had in class many times. I get to writing on the board, write things they say, and then we argue about the things, and then write what we conclude. And one time I filled up about 20 feet of whiteboards. And, we, and, and, and the class had gone on 30 minutes too long. And I noticed, and I brought it to a halt. Nobody else had noticed. And we just said, so. And we all sit there for like two minutes and just look at that. And I said, that's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> and they went, wow. You see? That's, that's the human being occupi occupied at ultimate capacity. Well, we live for that. That's right. But it also changes things that that's hard for us, right? It's a different kind of existence. Mm -hmm. It's the reason we imagine living that existence well would lead to a more perfect or a perfect existence because the imperfections tell you what perfection would be like. Right. It's a negative argument. Mm -hmm. well, we just have um, a minute or two left. Mm -hmm. And there is a final question uh, that, that we can dedicate that minute to, I think. This is from Richard uh, Bacigalupi from Langley, Washington. And he asks a very generous question. Is there a way the extended Hillsdale community can help the college in the current situation. Yeah. Uh, we've already said it, right? Here's what you should do. Um, you should learn, and you should teach, and you should help us reach people. Uh, y you know, we have events all over the country. We're having this one. This, I don't know how many people are on this, but many thousands. Um, we've canceled events under the pressure of the stupid virus that had like 3,000 people, 2,500 people maybe, mm. in, in, in that were coming. And uh, we love those things, right? And if you've been to one of them, you'll know. We don't get you in there to ask you for money, and we don't ask you for any money to attend. Because why? We're recruiting an army to save the republic. 
And that means your energy and your efforts and your mind are crucial. And people give us money and thank God for it. And I'm so grateful for it. Uh, people say to me, how can you have all those people together and not ask them for money? And I always say, well, they'll send it if they want to. And remember, the generosity is in them, not in us. So the thing that I urge is not that thing. The thing that I urge is learn. Help us get out of this mess. We will help you. Very good. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. This is David Whalen with Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College. Good evening.